Welcome to the Hollywood Dreams podcast. Uh, this is your host, Santi, along with my fellow host, Dave. Hey, Dave, what's up? How's it going, Santi? Alan, how are you? I'm doing all really? right. We, I, and tonight we got a great guest, uh, Alan Santalisa. Uh, hey, Alan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Yeah, I mean, it's an honor having you here. I think this is going to be a great episode. And for those who may not be, may not know who Alan is, he's a, he's, he's a guitarist. That's a, a great band called Shire, which I got the, this, this hot shot right here. <laughs> so you're the one that bought the album. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and actually, it's a, it's a really funny story how I got it, because it was so uh, random. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I saw this Facebook Marketplace uh, post uh, about uh, a couple of albums that a guy was selling, right? And, um, uh, and it had like a, the most random collection of albums like disco and whatever. And one of them was this one. <laughs> Which it was like nothing like the rest of the collection that he had. So I, Actually, I asked him about it. And, like him with this one. Yeah, and, and, and I asked him about it. He said, yeah, sure, you can have it. And and I, I he gave me this address of this really sketchy part of town. It, it, like, there's a lot of like squatters, uh, uh, houses and, and stuff like that. So I was, I was wondering if I'm going to get murdered. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever and uh, as, as just, I said just say fuck it I, I'll just go and I drove there uh, and, and this, this place is like the, the, it looked like a hoarder's house and it was like run down it, it looks like was a, a squatter's uh, like place right and it's not like it's a weird place and 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 this woman comes out with a couple of albums and say hey you're are you the guy that's selling the albums and yeah and people just came just keep came, coming out of the house like <laughs> I was just so weird uh, and then she gave me the album and here I, I I did not die and here I am so <laughs> yeah um I don't, know, I don't know how 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 on earth they got a hold of it if it was stolen or whatever from the original wow. owner or whatever but here it is <laughs> this is in Argentina uh, right yeah Argentina yeah uh Nice. <laughs> I remember yeah. some people from Japan used to write, and uh, I used to work in this really trendy street um, uh, called Meadows Avenue in Los Angeles. I used to uh, be an ice cream man, and the Japanese used to come in with the album to sign it, and then they used to take pictures of me while I was scooping the ice cream, and I was thinking, <laughs> please don't do that. You know, that's not a rock star thing to do, you know, to be seen in Japan <laughs> scooping ice cream while you have a record <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> you made hey, so, that a rock star thing <laughs> well it was a trendy you street own, you own that moment <laughs> yes yeah and he has like the like the lyric sheet and everything here so, oh my so gosh. Many, and um so you guys like are really young here right um i remember when it was recorded i was 18 and um uh, so were the other guys. We're all the same age. And when it came out, I was 19. 1984, I was 19. Yeah. I mean, you look like 19. Uh, <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, so 1984, was, was that like your first uh, serious foray in the music business? Absolutely. Uh, me and David, the singer, started this band when we were 16 years old. Um, and 
I don't think I had been in serious bands before that. But when we started, we were we got really serious right away. We thought we're gonna we're gonna do this seriously and professionally. How did you guys nice. uh, how did you guys hook up with Don Dockin and Michael Wagner? Um there was a big scene in the South Bay of LA, like Redondo Beach, Huntington Beach, you know, that area is near the south of where it's like a beach area. Very nice. There was a big heavy metal scene. We used to go down there to audition people in 1981. It took us a whole year to get the band going. We would go to the South Bay a lot and we auditioned. We just started knowing the musicians. Someone said, you know, Dawkin would be a really good producer for you guys. You know, he would really bring out the, the vocal and the harmonies at what we were going for, like a melodic, a melodic heavy metal sound, not, not too heavy. And uh, kind of like a lot like Doc. And we had his album that was out in Germany and we really loved it. So we thought we got to get a hold of this guy somehow. I don't remember exactly. We got in touch with him. And next, you know, we we're at his house and he goes, yeah, if you if you come up with the money, I will I will produce you and I'm going to make you sound great. He goes, uh, if you, just, you can make shitty records if you want to. But if you want the Doc and sound, you got to come to me. And he's, a, as you can tell, a very confident person. You know, very mm. stunning. He's like, you know, he doesn't he doesn't mess around when it comes to music or business. You know, he we just said it just like that. Right. I mean, yeah. it it does it, it it has a great production for an EP and 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 also, um, I don't know the the for example the song I, I really like the song Do You Know What It's Like, which I think is was like supposed to be like the big song on the EP, right? Uh, that was it. Yeah, we even make a video for it. We we went um, on this weird hills in the Topanga Canyon in um, in Los Angeles, and we made this video. Ironically, this is a weird story. To jump back later in the late '80s, Don Dawkins went in the same location and made a video uh, for one of his songs, which is weird yeah. because it's like we're thinking now he's imitating us. You know, <laughs> our, you know our video. <laughs> so, so so what's the deal with the were you guys like big lord of the rings fans or what's the deal with the name shire you know something i remember exactly we were thinking we gotta have a name that's not like stupid and nothing like you know mythical like zeus or pyrus or something like that we gotta it took a long time then we were in this kitchen at david's house and he comes out of the bathroom because i got it shire and we thought you know something even if they didn't know about the Lords in the Ring, it sounds like someone's last name. In fact, there was uh, a record producer a long time ago called David Shire. I don't remember what he produced, but he was a famous producer. So it sounds like someone's last name. It's easy to, to remember. It's short. You know, and we were like, okay, that's it. We're Shire. You know? Nice. We never had a name before that. We couldn't think of anything. <laughs> I think yeah. it is. I, I, I think it's... I think it's a cool name, but I love all the like the knights and and the fantasy world. That, that's I'm totally into all that stuff. So, yeah. Did you like the movies that came out, The Lord of the Rings? I did, but I, I'm more of a Conan the Barbarian fan. You go oh my back god, like eighty two and, and he's, yeah. he's more on, he's more on the big oily like muscly man, David. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, like the uh, saxophone player in Lost right. Boys. He'd be a perfect barbarian. <laughs> Tim Capello, yeah. perfect barbarian. There you go. I remember him. <laughs> uh, no, but I think I, I think it's good. I, I like the logo, and I, I I really like the like the picture of you guys like being putting on the, the like the pantyhose and all that. That's that's funny. That's, I that's his good. idea was that, but I I I forget. Someone came up with the concept. We're like, cool, cool, you know. A lot of bands were doing the, the thing there with women on the cover, like Rat or right, who yeah. else. A lot Rat always had women on the cover, you know. So we're like, okay, we us do then, you know. <laughs> yeah, hey, it worked for that time. It was perfect. Yes, for the time, yes. Absolutely. It's I also love how you list out who the hair and stylist was for the album. That's awesome. <laughs> the girlfriend of the of the drummer. Drummer, drummer's girlfriend Deborah, professional hairstylist. Um, to be honest, we when we were on our own plane, 
we didn't wear makeup. Our hair was all flat. But in case right. one of the girlfriends, or there was a girl, they're going, oh, let me do your makeup. It looks so cute. So we <laughs> let him. So sometimes we were glam. Sometimes we weren't. It happened that day that she was there. So that day we were glam, you know. It was yeah. like that. So, so yeah. which which clubs did you guys play most of the time? A lot. There was the Troubadour. Remember Troubadour? You heard that name? Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. It was great because you could start. They give you free tickets to give to your friends. You will start on a Tuesday. If you do good on a Tuesday, uh, you will play on a Thursday. And if you do good on a Thursday, we bring people. You will play on a Friday or Saturday night opening for someone big. We open for Black and Blue, I think. Great White Striper, the Christian guys. Who yeah. else? Um, I don't think we ever opened for Ra Steeler. Remember Steeler, Ron Keel? Yeah. 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 Man, he, he was really a great guy. He always had good guitar players in his band. Um, and what else was I going to say? Uh, not to jump ahead, but I saw the Guns N' Roses guy do this. They started on a Wednesday and there was nobody there. Then they graduated to another day, I think Thursday. And then soon they were opening for like glam bands here and there. And it didn't take them long in 1985 to really jump ahead and start becoming a headliner. They were kind right. of friends of us. Uh, Izzy Stradlin was in Shire for a year. Um, oh. I don't know if you guys knew that. Yeah, I, I was uh, gonna ring that up actually. Yeah. I read that online. So I wanted to hear <laughs> the story bass. from you. And Johnny Christ, the bass, the drummer Johnny Christ was playing with, uh, with them and with us at the same time they were called Hollywood Rose. And mm -hmm. then later, the very last gig of Shire, we had, uh, Rick, what did they call him? Rick Richards was the bass player with Rose. Came aboard to, to do our very last gig with Shire at the place called Gazaris. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we shared some members. Nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Nice. I mean, that's awesome. And you guys were there like from the very beginning. I mean, the early 80s. So how did you how did you how did you see the scene transform, right? Like from the early stages at the early 80s into what became like the later half of the decade you know i gotta say honestly i found that the early 80s the heavier metal scene like with wasp armor saint you know great white Duncan, um was a heavier i found it heavier and more the bands were more different you know the you, the, you had wasp was didn't sound like anybody black and blue was doing thing great white had their own thing uh who else was the armor saint ron keel Everybody different. And of course, we were different. We uh, Actually, we were like, our thing was we were the youngest. Everybody always used to say, these guys are really good. They're not even old enough to drink that, and, they're so, and they're good. Uh, that was the thing. You know, they're so young. Anyway, I found later on when the Guns N' Roses came up, everybody was trying to be like that. And I, you could go to the market and see these guys coming from, from different states with the tattoos and the cowboy boots and the teased up hair. And it was like, this a lot of this i mean there were some exceptions you know um that was china from jim torgerson that was really different they were like something like lords of the new church meets the cult very very original mm -hmm. interesting but like i said to my opinion my humble opinion um the majority were trying to copy guns and roses and i wasn't shy anymore and i i for a while i didn't know what i was going to do but i said to myself i'm not i'm not going to play in a copy of guns and roses no way. Right. You are not on the whole like uh, T-step hair glam thing. Oh, well, I, I was in a band called Motorcycle Boy in 1986 that we did that. But their music was more like uh, 70s punk. You know, it wasn't. Yeah, it was, I like that. Yeah. Look, um, Motorcycle Boy was a good band. They were produced by the by the guitar player of New York Dolls, Sylvain Sylvain. And had mm -hmm. a New York Dolls vibes. If anyone wants to hear it, it's on YouTube. Just like Shire. If anyone wants to hear Shire, it's all on YouTube. You just type mm -hmm. Shire EP or Motorcycle Boy full album, and boom, it's all there to, to hear the whole thing. Yeah, I actually really like um, the Motorcycle Boy stuff. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a great band. Yeah. Yeah. Francois, uh, my, my friend Francois, the singer, still plays. He's like, he's like he's in his 60s, and he plays that the whiskey still and uh, other places like that. You know, they still bring a lot of people and they're doing good. 
And he's still, but yeah. I mean, yeah. There's the whole like the whole reunion stuff that they yeah. do every year. Yeah, uh, with yeah, yeah. Glamour Punks and Blackboard Jungle. Like the, those bands. The, the Purple Hair Zeros. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, mm-hmm. yeah. So, so okay. So, so in eighty in eighty six, you did that, and 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 uh, did you ever like uh, felt like having like your own? Did you ever feel the need like? Hey, I gotta get Shire back together before uh, before it's too late or something like that. Well, the thing is, uh, we, we in the, instead of breaking up, we all started doing other things. Um, right. The singer did. Uh, uh, there were always bands uh, trying to steal him away from Shire. You know, um, mm. remember that band Icon from Arizona? Icon. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. great band. Yeah. yeah, they flew him out to Arizona to to go and sing with them. You know, and I was like, do, do it. You know, it's a good opportunity. You know, they had a record deal. The, as it turns out, I don't think he liked them. But, he, I, you know, they were trying to steal him. So I was like, yeah, do it, man. You know, not no problem. And, and I saw him in a band called Salient. Not one of the most popular bands. But at the time, you know, I went to see him at the Whiskey and it was packed. You know, and everybody liked him. Everybody liked Dave. So I was happy for him. I said, yeah, do it. And, I, and everybody in the band, uh, me and the drummer had, were in a band for a little while, but it was totally opposite. It was like Duran Duran. But I thought, okay. you know something? It, I like I liked him as a person and I was going to help him out. And I did some shows with him. So mm-hmm. we all slowly started doing other things. And uh, even to jump even way ahead, Shire didn't get back together until 2000 and. I'm on 2014. Yeah, we got back to it in 2014. Just me and David, though, with new people. The other right. guys, um, uh, the drama is not even in music anymore. And uh, um, Mick, the bass player, lives in Reno, um, Nevada. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. All right, so, yeah, I mean, from what I could, I mean, from what we hear uh, all all these interviews that we make uh, back then, a lot of the bands, I mean, if you were in LA, you were most likely playing in a lot of these bands at the same time. And people just, there were, some bands were like revolving doors, right? Like people just came, play a few shows and then they changed the drummer, changed the <laughs> the, the the singer, oh, whatever, right? It was something, it was- That's what we were like, like about, me and Dave were constant. It was our band yeah. Shire, but we had, Tons of people by some odd reason. I remember all their names. But after Izzy Stradling, you know, the first gig, there was like, we were five piece. Then after mm. Izzy Stradling, we were always just four, just one guitar, just me. And mm. it was like that. It's people would get, we get tired of them or they would get tired of playing with us. And we'd be like, put an ad in the paper and meet new people. It was, right. it was just, keep it going. It was like that for the Guns N' Roses guys too. Um, yeah, yeah. I know so many people that went in and out of that band um, that it was like that. I, you go see him and it's like, wow, new people. Even Izzy sometimes was in the band. I went and saw him one time. Actually, we were played together. It was Poison um, and Shire upstairs in this place called Madame Wong's West in Santa Monica. Mm-hmm. It was a two-level a club. And uh, Rose or Hollywood Rose, I remember the name, was downstairs. And it was Slash. This guy named Steve Darrow, a cool bass player that I, I knew. Um, Steven Adler on drums and just action, four piece. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was great. That was one of the first time that I was like, first I was like, where's Izzy? You know, that's the thing that always is like to this day, where's Izzy? He wasn't <laughs> there, but um, uh, it was good. They did a Nazareth song, you know, Hair of the Dog, you know, that one. Now you're messing with the son of a bitch. Um, mm-hmm. It was so good. That was the first time I thought to myself, this this could be really big, you know. Right. Yeah, and, and Guns N' Roses eventually recorded that song. Oh, really? And, they did. Yeah, um, for the covers what? album they had. Really? Yeah, I, oh, I believe cool. it's on. I believe it's on Spaghetti Incident. I believe. Yeah, oh, it man. is. Oh, cool. Yeah. I don't have that one. I, I gotta get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, they do some interesting stuff. They do a Charles Manson song, and they do they well, do I'm a not few other uh, <laughs> interesting tracks. It is. <laughs> We're good for good for them. Yeah, it's a pretty pretty <laughs> interesting album. Um, wow. Yeah. So so it was kind of like uh, you were kind of like that band London who were like 
have people come in and go, yeah. and then and then two weeks later they'd be rock stars. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Well, we had only Izzy that became famous. Um, but uh, I remember London very good because you know something I saw him when I got in to Hollywood, I mean, at Los Angeles, I was 14, 1979. I went to a club called the Starwood. I'm sure you heard of the Starwood. I saw London and on bass was Nikki Six, And they had a keyboard player, it almost sounded like a cross between the babies and Journey, very slick, polished rock and roll. Um, the singer was um, Nigel Benjamin, a British guy that had been uh, replaced Ian Hunter, Mata Hooper for two albums. So he was an amazing voice and he was really young too. I mean, not, he was not as young as the rest of the guys, but uh, out of that band, only the guitar player Lizzie Gray kept going with London because of Nicky Six, of course, a year later, two years later, he, you know, he did Motley Crue and they took off real fast. Right. Um, and then one time I went to see him again at the Starwood and there was Blackie Lawless. Um, uh, of, of Wasp from lead vocals, so you're right. They had everybody. It was yeah. it was crazy. <laughs> yeah, a lot yeah. of people. One time uh, we played at a place called the the uh, LA Street Scene Festival downtown LA. You know they blocked the streets and there'd be mm -hmm. bands playing everywhere. Um, we played and then I after us there was London and there was Slash and Izzy in the band. You know, wow. so they got everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Like an all-star yeah. jam. Yeah, sounds that, awesome. <laughs> that would be cool to like just to have that where the streets are blocked off and you have all the that would be awesome. I'd love that. The the third year they did it, the gangs went crazy <laughs> and you know they started all kind of trouble and fires. Uh, so that was the last time of the LA street scene. Wow. Yeah. Maybe they got mad because we weren't playing. Somebody's no, got yeah, somebody somebody's gotta come along and ruin the good time. Yeah. <laughs> we took yeah, trips in the bloods to fuck it up. Yeah, right. I mean, sure. I mean, on one hand, it's it's awesome. That there was no like social media or cell phones back then. But at the same time, I I just wish there was more footage of all that stuff, like all those little oh, shows. No and yeah, because yeah, I hear you. Because a lot of times you just rely on stories that people tell you, right? But there's no actual like footage that you can watch or, or anything like that. Yeah. Well, I've seen so many bands play for the first time became became famous that if you have anybody that you want to ask me about <laughs> what they were like in the beginning, uh, I might not know everybody, but I um. I probably know a lot of them. So if you want to ask if I see any, I saw, you know who I saw that blew me away? Uh, Ingve Malmsteen, fresh mm -hmm. off the boat from Sweden, plays at the Roxy with Stile, with Ron Keel. Boy, everybody was there. And it was one of those nights where you could see one show and then they play again later, you know, twice in one night. Mm -hmm. Everybody stayed for the second show and they were like, they called their friends, you got to come here now and see this. And I saw both shows and, you know, Ingrid Monsting is Ingrid Monsting, you know, whether you like that style or not, you know, he's oh, amazing. Yeah. He yeah, was his only style 18. is great. It's his attitude that could be the problem. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's, uh, <laughs> I couldn't tell back then, but he, he was a little bit hard to deal, I guess. <laughs> well, I he might imagine. not have been back then. He might, he might, have, he might have grew into that. Yeah, yeah. Well, everybody <laughs> was uh, praising him all the time, you know, that can go to your head. Oh, I mean, yeah. I it's like but <laughs> <Very dust>. yeah <laughs> did, did you see poison uh before they got big first show ever in poison is the one i talked about they were they were produced by this guy famous producer kim fowley who produced the runaways mm -hmm. oh, they yeah. came into uh madame wong's west and we opened for them shire play with poison downstairs was um actual and slash with rose or hollywood rose whatever they're called that was their very first show then later we started uh, to to play more shows with them. You know, we their manager Vicky Hamilton, where, uh, who managed Poison Fest, the Pussycat. Who else? Tons Other bands. Fest. Uh, who, yeah, yeah. Very, yeah. <laughs> how could I forget that yeah. one? Of them? <laughs> yeah, Poison Fest, the Pussycat, the biggest band and, of all time. And she and she uh, she was involved with Motley Crue early on as well. Yeah, that's right. That's right. She, she was. Played, uh, her, I think 
I think she worked at uh, Licorice Pizza, and Nikki was coming there. I, 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 I worked there too with her. Licorice Pizza. Oh, you and the, worked with her? She That's hired awesome. me. She, she was. Uh, she gave me the job. I worked nice. with her, and um, apparently Stephen Piercy worked there before me from Rat. Uh, but no. they farmed. He, he couldn't make it on time. Yeah. There, well, there's a shock. <laughs> yeah, that's a shock. What a great place to work. She's so cool. Vicky Hamilton is one of the nicest people you could ever meet. Uh, she never managed shy, but she got us gigs. You know, oh. she got us um, uh, gigs opening for uh, with Shark Island. Remember Shark Island? Yeah. Yeah, great yeah. band. Yeah, yeah. 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 I love that band. Yeah. The and Shark Island. Uh, we always play with Shark Island for some reason. Striper, we play with Striper, the Christian guys. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I didn't like them too much. They were always trying to get me to pray. And I was like, <laughs> I don't think so, man. This is rock you, and roll. You don't strike me as your religious kind. Well, you Maybe mean, you mean you weren't throwing out Bibles at Shire shows? No, we were throwing out porno magazines. <laughs> that's, that's the gig I'm going to. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, um, later on, uh, Vicky Hamilton came by that place where I wore the ice cream store. And she's like, are you in a band? I'm like, no. And she's like, well, I'll help you out. And she got me to audition. Uh, remember the movie, The Decline of Civilization, Western Civilization oh, yeah. Part the Metal Years? Yeah. Do you remember Randy O of Odin? Yeah. Yeah. She got me to audition for uh, Randy O of Odin. You oh, know, nice. and I was like, thank you. But it didn't work out. It didn't work out. <laughs> um, my, I had such problems that day that I went there with my amp and then when I turned it on it picked up a Mexican radio and and they got all, they were like they got all mad they were like can you make that stop and I was like I'm trying you know I don't know what's going on and my amp turned into a radio but uh, I didn't get that gig wow exactly. <laughs> you, you tell you you got Randy O mad you can't do that oh, yeah. The last thing you ever said to me, he goes, do you have your car here with you? <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I think that's uh, Jerry Dixon from Warren. I think that's his cousin. I think those guys are cousins. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know yeah, that. I, wow. You might want to Google that one, but I'm pretty sure I'm correct on that. Yeah. Right. Never met anybody from Warren. Uh, that was a little after my time. You know, that was like already the the middle 80s and kind of late 80s was warrant I, I never met him never saw him even never saw him play okay. well so so after so after shire and motorcycle boy yeah you, just, you didn't you didn't hang around the scene or you you did or well you're not gonna believe this I, I joined I, I formed a goth band and i play all the goth club you know like sisters oh, of america okay. we we're called submission and uh, like submarine mission. And um, I, I like doing that. I like, I, I saw the cult play, you know, when they were like the 60s kind of cult, not the heavy metal cult. And there was a band called Gene Loves Jezebel. Remember that, the twins? Oh, yeah. Love those guys, yeah. Great band. I, I saw that and I thought, you know what? I like more like this, more like, more like clean guitars with a lot of reverb and echo, not distortion, not screaming or nothing, kind of low singing. Um, yeah. I'm more into that. I would play with Submission. Uh, who else did I play with? Uh, a couple of bands. Um, well, I know the fact thing, word. I'm sorry? I was just going to say that that, what you were doing with, with Submission, yeah. there were a few bands that came along after bands like, like Bang Tango kind of adopted that that sound and that style, the, the gothic yeah. look. They, um, the gothic, I agree. I agree with that. Yeah, there's a lot of bands that bridge like the gap between glam and hard rock and, and goth, like Gene Loves Jazzle is an example, right? Or bands mm -hmm. like Lions and Ghosts and uh Audition for know. Lions and Ghosts. Did you know I uh, audition for Lions Ghosts on bass? Oh really? Really? <laughs> yeah. Um I met one of them and I go, What do you want me to learn? He gave me a, a tape with eleven songs and mm -hmm. I go, which one do you want me to learn? He goes, all of them. And I was like, I have a week, you know? But I played this tape to death and I put the headphones, the tape in the headphones. I used to go to sleep listening to their music. Right. So we, I still didn't know it. And uh, they had, it was between me and the guy from Cheap Trick, Pete Comida. You know, Cheap Trick, of course, right? Because, Pete yeah. Comida had played on the record 
and he knew all the songs already. So I was like, why don't you, why don't you just get him? And so they got him. <laughs> they got him instead of me. But you know, so I love that band. I so wish later I I get to know uh, the singer Rick Park is a producer and I produces bands in Hollywood. Um, mm-hmm. It's a very unique original band, like you said. They mix all the styles. A little bit of this, a little bit of goth melody replacements. I heard a little bit of the replacements with them too. You know the mm-hmm. band from Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis. Amazing, so, yeah. um, but Lions of Ghost was one of the best, one of my favorites. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a great band, and 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 yeah, there were a lot of uh, uh, most most like uh, the early the late eighties. I mean, um, a lot of bands were trying to be different. Um, some of them want the funky like vibe. Others went the others went that like semi goth ghost. Uh, Lions and Ghosts type bands, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, but but yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. It's interesting, and you, and you definitely were an early adopter of that style, I guess, because yeah. It, well, um, in England, the goth had been around since like I say 1981 with Bauhaus, you know. Then Sisters mm-hmm. of America. In America, there was Christian Death, who was kind of like right. punk goth, and mm-hmm. then they became, you know, more. There were more bands. I I can. 45 grave uh tsol kind of went in that direction as well yeah i just saw joe wood play at the viper room man he joe oh, wood wow. is unbelievable he uh he played with the what were they called i think it was just called joe wood um yeah. great voice great voice still you know he's an older guy oh. but voice is great yeah yeah awesome yeah and uh, so did you so your scene was more like the early 80s. You were more of an early 80s guy, right? Uh, I mean, it sounded like you enjoyed that era a lot more than what came after. Well, there was, um, I can name a few bands in the late 80s that I like. There was a band called Electric Angels. You probably heard yeah. that record. Yeah, well, I love yeah great uh, band uh, with uh, yeah. Jonathan Daniel uh, from Candy. Daniel Shane on lead vocals. Yeah. Um, they, and Ryan Roxy, who plays with Alice Cooper, was in Electric mm-hmm. Angels. Um, you know, they, I got to say, even though Tony Visconti, who produced David Bowie, produced their album, they sound a lot better live. Um, mm-hmm. But if you want to see them live, they have uh, some videos of them live at the Music Machine uh, on YouTube. Just put the Electric Angels live at the Music Machine and you can okay. see a few songs and you'll see what I mean. Okay. Okay. Nice. Yeah. yeah they're I mean, they, 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 they're a great band. And- Got a lot of great songs for YouTube sure. YouTube is a great way to discover stuff. And obviously you guys on YouTube, which is great. But mm-hmm. a lot of bands that you want to know um, are probably on there. Demo tapes, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I am, um, I'm only 30, right? So I'm, <laughs> I, I was not around young for, for all <laughs> this stuff back then. I was, uh, I was around for it all. I so, yeah, awesome. what, I, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the way that I discovered uh, most of the bands that I like, including Shire, for all, for, for, the, for, for that matter, is is in the internet, right? Uh, I, I became sort of a music archaeologist <laughs> and and and, uh, and and started like collecting all those demos and, and stuff from bands. I, I've always been attracted to these smaller bands like never had either didn't get a record deal or just released like a couple of demos and that's it and stuff like that those were the, yeah. the, the bands that interested me the most and that's what got me into the whole like sunset strip scene because a lot of the bands never quite made the breakthrough to get a full album or, or a record deal right and, and, and see then, i uh, i thought i knew a lot about the bands this mm-hmm. guy blew me away when we the first time we talked, uh, uh, what was supposed to be a five-minute conversation turned into a three-hour phone call, wow. and then and then then Santi inviting me to join the podcast, and of course I had to say yes. No, nah, so that's cool. And, <laughs> and then and then over over the past two years, we've built up this friendship, and you know we have a, we have a, a love of the music, and. Um, yeah, and Santi, yeah. you find your your info on the internet. Where did I find most of my music from? The one and only Shattered Records. Shattered Records. We haven't had a Shattered <laughs> Records story in a while. 
<laughs> nice. we, we haven't. I, I've been trying. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I've been trying to avoid it, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I don't have one now. Nah, I'm just kidding. What do you want? <laughs> No, go ahead. I, no, Shire never played Cleveland, Ohio, right? Uh, we uh, simply never went on tour past Arizona. We never made past Arizona. Yeah. Um, you guys would have loved Cleveland. Yeah, I we know. Had a, we had a pretty vibrant it rock good. scene. It was a great rock scene. I I don't know. Late, uh, about, let me see, 2000 and, from 2004 to 2008, I, I I don't know if you probably remember the girl group uh, L7, you know, the grunge girls. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I was in a band with uh, the lead singer, Donita Spar. She had a solo project. And mm-hmm. I was in our band. We played everywhere. We played in Cleveland. It was great. Oh. I forgot. Empire oh, Concert Club? Grog Shop. Grog Is Shop. It? You guys, you played the Grog Shop. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cleveland Heights. yeah. Absolutely. Nice. Yeah, I like that. I, and a lot of people, wherever she plays, you know, they, have, they still have a lot of fans. They're back together now. But back then, it was just her and the drummer, D. You know, two guys and two girls, it was. Yeah. And uh, if anybody wants to see that, it's on YouTube, too. You can see us playing in Brazil in front of, like, yeah, 2000. Yeah, I want to check that out. Yeah. yeah definitely check that out. I like that she did a lot. No footage the- from the grog shop, though, huh? Uh, let me, th- you know something? I think there was a video from the grog shop, just one song. Really? <laughs> Don't need a right, spark hunt- frog shop. All right, I'll yeah. be hunting that down. There's always a Cleveland connection somehow. All, all yeah. of these show all these episodes that we do. <laughs> like uh, Ian Hunter says, you know, like Ian Hunter says Cleveland rocks. Cleveland rocks. Oh, yeah. 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 And 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 that's also the name of the documentary that uh David is uh, putting together. Yeah, I'm oh, working, yeah, on, yeah. Yeah. working on a Cleveland Rocks documentary. I've been working on it for two years. I'm sure a lot of people are kind of giving up on it, but I'm not giving up on it. I just got to get some more interviews done and and then get it pieced together. And, and hopefully within the next year, two at the most, I'll have it done complete. And I want to make sure when I put something out, I want it to be right. You know what I mean? I I, I want to represent each band the right way and and... I don't want to see any bullshit. Good luck with that, man. Sounds, sounds like an interesting thing that I well, don't see. And Santi is also doing a documentary on your scene. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm about the Sunset Trip. Uh, yeah, it's called Riot on Sunset. And I'm probably going to use uh, some stuff that we are recording today on that, uh, on that documentary yeah, as well. It's, uh, it's great. So right? we're, we're, trying, we're trying our best to yeah. keep the music alive. So that is so cool. Whatever we can do. Yeah, yeah. So, so going back to to what brings us together today, uh, how would you describe, like in your own words, of course, how would you describe uh, the Hollywood scene uh, back back then? Um, crowded. That's <laughs> that's all I can say. Um, like I said, there was two scenes, in my opinion, early eighties, late eighties. Yeah. Um, early eighties was like. Yeah, a lot of people were were um, doing music, but you know when you got MTV, Headbangers Ball. Remember Headbangers Ball? You do, I'm yeah. sure, Dave. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, every watching, Saturday night. Yeah, everybody it seemed like everybody was coming out here thinking, you know, the 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 getting is good, you know, the timing is right, and they were right. You could, if you were lucky, and you're catchy enough, good enough, you get a record deal. Everybody was looking for the next Guns N' Roses. That's why you got bands like Junkyard, Sea Hags, you know. Um, who else? Uh, even Bang Tango, I thought, probably they were thinking, you know, yeah. they, they could be the next Guns N' Roses. And they almost were with that song. I was Someone like you was always on MTV. So you never know, you know. Or even uh, Randy O, you know, he had a vibe like that later. He was starting Heavy Metal with Odin, and then his band Lost Boys was more, was more rock and roll, more, you know, dirty rock and roll. That's what yeah. I thought. So, yeah. like I said, it was, a, I would describe it as very crowded scene, but it was, there was opportunity, you know. Um, of course, I, I personally, I stopped caring about that. I just wanted to do what I liked, but 
if you wanted to, there was these magazines that came out every week. One was called Music Connection. You know, maybe Dave, you heard of it, or maybe you guys both heard of it, Music Connection. And there was yeah. the Recycler. That's how yeah. Shire met a lot of people. We met Easy Strand to that. Uh, if you looked at the back, it was mainly Recycler was to sell cars, to look for a job. But at the very end, there was a section for musicians. If you look at that section, it was full of ads, and everybody would say, um, Ben into Motley Crue and Guns N' Roses, you got to have the looks, the moves, and the grooves. We have record company interest. We have management interest. Of course, you know, you'd go talk to them, you go see them, and it was nothing like that. You know, most a lot of them, you know, it was lies. But then there was a positive side to us. Some people were really serious. And, like, I remember the Vicky Hamilton manager bank called Salty Dog. Yeah. Remember mm -hmm. Salty? She got me an addition with Salty Dog, too. And also, again, you know, here I am, like a gothic guy. I would go because I was like, you know, Vicky has got me this addition. I should go. But here she's up a gothic guy all in black. And there's these guys that look like surfers. So oh. it, it didn't work. But yeah. Salty Dog was really serious and really, really good. And they got signed to Geffen, you know. They went yep. to Wales to an, um, an album that came out really good. And unfortunately, they came out right. You know, after the people say that in 92 or 91, when Nirvana came out, that the whole scene started Peter Peter out. Um, mm -hmm. From my opinion, it started even a little earlier than that. Because as you can see, Electric Angels album didn't do good. Salty Dog didn't do good. And these were pretty good records, even a little bit on the radio. But yeah. then doing nothing. I don't know why. You know, uh, it was done be even before, you know, before well, the grunge it just yeah. it just became too convoluted i mean there were so many bands that were just kind of tripping over each other all trying to look the same all trying to sound the same um exactly you had a couple bands come out uh late in that scene a band like ugly kid joe who came out oh, yeah. and kind of had had some humor and a little bit of funk they had a little bit of success with that yeah. It wasn't obviously it, everybody knows about the Seattle thing, but yeah. I just feel like if, if bands would have been a little more open to a little bit more diversity before they had got too big in one style, I, yeah. I think it would have worked out a little more. I mean, sometimes like there's bands today that that don't kind of they don't get uh, pigeonholed into a certain style to begin with. And then they, they seems like they have a little more freedom with branching out and doing different things. If you That's, were like, like if you were poison and yeah. you started to do something a little darker, you were yeah. going to fail. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. I remember that they had their hair down, they got all tattoos, you know, it was like, but it's still poison. So that's what they're known from and for. And um, I mean, I, I think poison still packs wherever they play, especially in Los Angeles, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, they have a lot of fans. But but, but you look back, you look at that Native Tongue album. Oh yeah, it was a little different. CC wasn't there. It, yeah, it, it, in my opinion, it's a great album. I I love what they did on that album. But you know, nobody nobody wanted to give it the time of day because it was a little bit different. It was a little bit darker. Um, and I know it's a yeah. darker time for the band, but yeah, the same with I mean, the Pussycat and and Warren. Remember Festa Pussycat, the third album. They're all wearing yeah. combat boots, and he dyed his hair black. And, and Warren, yeah, which is a Warren's good. Doggy Dog, is a great album. Exactly, and it's exactly. Nowhere. Yeah, yeah, and and that whipped album, uh, the Festa Pussycat whipped album. I mean, it's arguably better than the second album, in my opinion. I think it is. I think it's way better than the second yeah. album. Oh, yeah. I wasn't really that impressed with. Uh, the second well, there's a whip there's a way, there's uh, whip, whip way and yeah. stuff like that i mean there's a few songs yeah but i thought yeah. whip was, a, was like yeah, yeah. no i agree i that. agree and I, I i mean from what i can gather uh, uh from all the interviews that i've made there's also the fact that um labels did not want to take the risk if the band did not like hit it big on a on the first single that they put out right if the band puts a single it doesn't sell okay they they just drop the band and maybe that contributed a little bit as well mm -hmm. to, to 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 the like the fizzling out of the scene right i mean if the if, if 
just bands did not get support from their labels uh it's just not going to happen right in, you know in a pre internet world and uh, that's all that you <laughs> that that's that's uh, that's everything for you i mean there's no well, other way i i got another story right that to just kind of jump ahead from the 80s to the 90s i yes. answered in the music connection i met this really young guy named eden and his band was called Eden, E D A N. You might have seen that CD. Oh, yeah. It's called Flower. I, I, I heard that. Yeah. And I like your album. Saint Laser. Mm -hmm. I'm on that record. He was uh, Aaron Everly's, Axel Rose's wife, brother. That's who mm. he is. Oh, okay. And uh, we got a, first a deal with Geffen and then Hollywood Records. Our album came out, I say, either two weeks before or two weeks after uh, Nirvana's record. And um, and that was the end. We were guys that also wore velvet and and uh, and makeup. Our music was kind of like the Black Crows. I feel. I mean, I mean you've heard oh. it, kind of. Black yeah, Crows. I mean, I, I really like the album, and and I, I totally forgot that you were on that album. I'm sorry, <laughs> but but uh, I the, forget too. The 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 Faith Healer is the song that I like the most of that album. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, Faith Healer, and. Um, what did I, I wrote three songs on that record, man, and it gave me a lot of money. I gotta say, I don't <laughs> just for three. But that company was owned by Disney. Hollywood Records was owned by Disney, and Disney has a lot of money. They signed Queen, you know. They signed Queen, and unfortunately, the last Queen record didn't do that good. But we were supposed to open for Queen, and then poor Freddie Mercury died. So what oh, happened no. is we opened for Brian May in Hollywood at the Palace. We got a gig opening for Brian May. You know, and it would have been great to play with Queen. Now, so many people would have seen it, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that talk about, like, yeah. I mean, that, that would have been incredible for sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah so it's but still, I mean, getting a gig with Brian May is still pretty cool. Yeah. No. Yeah, <laughs> Brian. Yeah. And, and I love he, his, he, uh, he I love his uh, soundtrack work he's done. Oh, he, yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, I'm a uh, big fan of like his stuff he did for Mad Max and Highlander, Highlander, right? Highlander, yep. And I mean, yeah. tons of movies back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got, you know, he's when he plays, you know, it's him. Oh, you know? absolutely. Yeah. You guys did a great cover of Dead Flowers on that album. You know, that was an original. <laughs> you know, it's not a cover. I wrote it. No, I wrote the music. I told. Uh, really? I, 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 I'm sure it was. Oh, okay. I'm, 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 I'm mixing it up with another album. It's not the sounds. I told Eden, please, dude, don't call it Dead Flowers. I go, what are we going to do the next album? Call it Purple Haze? You know? Right. You know? <laughs> but you're people like Santa. <laughs> yeah. You know something? Um, Eden's the kind of guy that has different tastes. He is a good player, but doesn't know anything about the scene or he doesn't care. He likes like people like Todd Rundgren. Remember the Todd Rundgren guy? Um, mm -hmm. kind of progressive. I mean, you can't tell about what he plays, but his taste is where he likes the tubes, you know, the old tubes, you know, from San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. He didn't know about the Stones or nothing. In fact, our producer said to me, you know, I hate the Stones records because they're all out of tune. And I said to him, you are out of your mind. You know, I wanted to fire him, but I didn't have the the power to fire him. You know, he he was like a, a clean, clean cut cut of guy. To say that the stones are no good, I was like, I'm gonna kick this guy's ass, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean well the Eden stuff, that's interesting because that to me I I, I always put that band uh in the category category bands like Hanoi Rocks or like, like uh, the Gypsy yeah. Rock bands like the Jet Boy Hanoi Rocks uh, I don't know uh, the Choir Boys Ducks and Do you yeah. know I want to know something? Andy McCoy, Andy McCoy of Hanoi Rocks almost played on that record, oh. but of course he didn't, didn't know who he was, so he says no way. You know, oh. again, I was like, Eden, please, Eden, listen to me. This guy's cool. It gives you such credibility to have a guy who hundred rocks play on your record. He charges people to play on his record. He was going to do it for free, you know, because he <laughs> was dating um, 
he was actually married to Aaron Zeverly best friend, Angela. Angela McCoy was a friend with Aaron. We went to his house. He had a house in the Hollywood Hills. They gave, um, Geffen Records gave Honey Rocks a lot of money, especially Andy McCoy, to re-release all the records. And he spent it all. He bought a big house. He went, he spent, I don't know what he did, but he spent all his money. But in, the, in 1991, while we're recording the album, he said, I will, I will play on your album, you know? And um, of course, it didn't happen. Oh, luckily, though, we got Tom Peterson of Cheap Trick, because Cheap Trick is like one of my favorite bands of all times. He played on the track Day, Day by Day, it's Tom Peterson playing bass. You can tell it's him because Tom Peterson likes to strum the bass. You know, it's a so on this, the beginning of the song, you just hear this rumble, and you know it's Tom Peterson. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it's so a shame. These are I mean, the these are the stories shame. we like. Yeah, yeah, it, it, they are. I, it, it's 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 so funny because the way you, you tell it, it's it's like everybody knew everybody <laughs> back then. Yes. yes. Yeah. Everybody knew everybody. I miss some of these people, and I I, am, I don't see him anymore. I I uh, I was so happy to see Jim Torgerson. I he probably doesn't even remember me from Shire, but. Um, cause that China was later, China was 1985, I think. Um, but that was one of my favorite bands. Absolutely. Oh yeah. No, I mean, uh, well, and did you, did, did you go to the cat house back then? Uh, Ricky Rackman's hat cat house? No, cause that had a reputation to have a lot of strippers and loose women and my girlfriend oh. wouldn't let me go there. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you're okay. <laughs> you were stunned from the cat house, but yeah, exactly. from the cat house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. You know that that's just about as rock star as scooping ice cream. <laughs> I can't say I was much of a rock star, but I tried. <laughs> that's awesome. I mean. So, so you guys got back together in 2014 with a different lineup, well, half uh, a different lineup. Uh, I guys, did you ever guys felt like, hey, we may, maybe we can start recording again, or or, or like write some songs and, uh, yeah. and stuff like that? That um, that website I sent you, uh, Reverb Nation, mm -hmm. those six songs. Um, they were uh, half of them are new, some of them are old Shire songs from early 80s. Um, they were recorded at David's house. The singer has a re his own recording studio in a in the he has a house in the desert in Santa Clarita, or I don't know if it's a desert, but it looks it looks deserted. Uh, but it's like um, he has a 24 track studio, and nice. uh, we did all the recording, we practice upstairs in the house. Um, actually, he has two houses back to back. One is the rehearsal studio, and the other is the recording studio. We did mm. all those recordings there. Um, he um, is really good engineer producer. He went to school for it. Um, so as, as you can tell, it sounds uh, as good as the album, if not better. You know. Yeah, and that yeah. song "Fragile" uh, was that one of the new ones, or was that recorded back then? Actually, I wrote that in 1995 when I was in a I was in a Britpop band when I would turn 30. I started writing a lot of songs for some reason. I don't know why. I couldn't sleep. I I couldn't. I never slept, and I I just drove around, you know, for hours. And I was writing songs in my head. And Fragile was one of them. Now, if you want to hear this band, you probably there's no way you've ever heard this because we never. The record never came out, but we have a video on YouTube. It's called Heavenly Bodies, and it's called I Can't Please You. You might like that. It was a yeah. band kind of Britpop, like Suede. You know Suede? Yeah, I like Suede. Yeah. Uh, kind of like even a little cheap trick, a little American sound, even, but Britpop. You'd, you'd have to hear. But one of the songs we did were Fragile. Uh, later on, 2015 or something, I played it for Dave, and he goes, yeah, I, I can do something with this song. You know, he made it his... He sang it his own way, and he goes, I, I can do this. I can do this one. So we did and recorded it. Yeah. 
I mean, it's a great song, and and I totally, yeah. I mean, you tell me it was uh, your Brit pop phase makes total sense because it, I t uh, when you showed it to me, I told you it has like that Beatles vibe to it, right? It sounds like something like the Beatles would have put out in the '90s or something like that. Yeah. That's a great compliment. It has that vibe. Yeah. Thanks, man. I mean, sure, was... Yeah, it definitely does. Uh, yeah, that's sort yeah. of uh, enough's enough. Uh, I, I was thinking enough's yeah. enough too. Yeah. Enough's enough live, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, 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 enough. I met Chips enough on his birthday, so I didn't know what I didn't have any money to get him anything. So I stole one of those parking things where it says no parking, and I pulled it out of the ground. And on the other side, I drew his face and I said, "Happy birthday, uh, uh, happy, happy, oh Chip, yeah, it's happy birthday, Chip. You're number one." And when he saw it, he goes, "That's so sweet." You know that voice that he has. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, <laughs> it's it's so funny how you. I mean, you is sort of like a rock and roll droopy, right? Like, it, uh, like the dog droopy. You're <laughs> you're, you're everywhere <laughs> and, and uh, hanging out with everybody. <laughs> the Allen movie Zelig. Remember that? Yeah. So maybe you don't remember, but it's a funny movie, Zelig. Throughout his Woody Allen, yeah. Pictures, yeah. Woody Allen had pictures, and he's in all the pictures, you know, with like Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was really bizarre. You have to see it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's a great movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, as long as there's no pictures of you, Alan, with Hitler out there. Oh, no, I'm not that old. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> it's a sad story to tell you, but. If since you brought it up, my grandfather was in a concentration camp in, in Dachau oh. for wow. two years. Oh, wow. He was Jewish, but he he employed Jewish people. So I always think about him, you know, I was like, I can't believe yeah. one, you no, know, what, two generations away and somebody went through something like that. Now, yeah. this is not a good story to tell on this show. So I'll change the subject right away. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, uh, what nationality are you? I'm half Italian. I grew up in Italy since I was 10 months old. So I have okay. this action. My mother was from Indianapolis. My dad was from Trieste, Italy. Oh, nice. So we are okay. close. Uh, I mean, my family is Italian as well. Um, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm part Italian as well. Oh, so Ooh, what's your last we, name, Dave? We got that. What's that? What, what is your last name, Dave? Melikant. Your last... Oh, Dave. Monaghan? Mel Melikant. Malik, oh, so it sounds Irish. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> my dad was my dad was Italian and Polish. Oh, I got it, got it, cool. Yeah. Yep. You know, Dave from uh, uh, Dave Anthony from Shire is Polish. He of uh, Polish descent. His his real name is Jagos with a S Z. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Man. Interesting. Maybe I shouldn't I shouldn't have uh, outed that. You know, <laughs> he wanted to be. <laughs> Forever. Santi, do your do your editing. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna keep the keep the rock and roll mystery, right? You, you like never the, know. You never know what's gonna come out on Halloween. <laughs> That's how it's supposed to be. Well, you on the album, you styled your name differently as well. You're Saint Lisa. Yeah, you know, I never liked my name. You know, now I go by the name Alan Delon, which was a French actor in the '60s. You know, a lot of people. I write me on Facebook and say, you know, you look great for your age. And I'm like, the guy's 86 <laughs> years old, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you, you can tell that, yeah, I have the accent. You can, you can tell them, hey, I, I got the European accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do not have an accent. But well, you got the Ohio <laughs> accent. I guess. I guess. I have the, uh, yeah, the Ohio slant, the Ohio twang. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't uh, uh, Trent Reznor? Trent Reznor was he from Cleveland, right? He, he was. Yeah, he was. Oh, he is. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I remember. I remember seeing uh, seeing them in clubs over here under the Exotic Birds. That was that was the band, and then oh, they eventually was... they they turned into Nine Inch Nails. And oh, actually, yeah. Pretty Hate Machine was recorded here in Cleveland. Oh, so. my God. I like that record a lot. I, I love it. it. I love it. Yeah. Downward, Downward Spiral was good, too. It very, was. Very... That, that, that's crazy that he recorded that at the Sharon Tate house. 
Oh, that's he right. Rented, he he rented there. the Sharon Tate house before they, you know, and um, yeah, I, I've heard some interesting stories about that uh, recording session, but we'll get Trent Reznor on the show to talk about that. I'm sure he's waiting in line to, oh, to be I'm our sure guest. <laughs> Hey, it'd be it'd be cool to have him on. Him and him and Marilyn Manson could come on and. Oh yeah, great be... Hollywood Hollywood alumni, Marilyn Manson and, and Trent Reznor, right? <laughs> you know those guys were influenced by the uh, Hollywood scene. You know that. I don't oh know yeah, I mean, in, in some way or another, I'm sure. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so okay. so so, okay. Alan. Um, just to start wrapping up the episode, uh, we always ask our guests what their like Desert Island uh, albums would be. So, uh, if you had to pick up, pick like I don't know, five albums uh, to take on a Desert Island, uh, which ones would they be? Okay, I totally know that. Uh, number one, um, David Bowie, Ziggy Stardust. And the Spiders of Mars, the right, uh, the rise and fall of Ziggy Star and Spiders of Mars. Great album, yeah, I love it. Number two, uh, Cheap Trick in color and black and white. Um, then number three, Def Leppard, High and Dry. I love that oh, record. Yeah, yeah that, that my favorite album of all time. Yeah, oh yeah, I saw them on that tour. Um, wow. They were uh, they blew everybody away. You know, there was like oh, yeah, three. They were so uh, energetic so, and just yeah, charisma, everything, the songs, the voice. Yep. Um, so that's three albums, right? Uh, then the Cult, Love. Um, I, I, the oh, the yeah. one that came out in '85 before they been, went hard rock. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. number four, there's got to be something recently that I liked. There's got to be. Let me think. What's the number? Uh, you know, I got. Well, I'll just go with four albums. I can't believe it. I went and me think. Well, I, the Shire. Why not the Shire EP? <laughs> so many times that I don't even. Have, I can hear it in my head. I don't even have to put it on. <laughs> I always like how you guys, uh, I, I, like in special thank yous, uh, you added like add your name here and a blank line for the like the fans to add their name. That's cute. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. I do like Black, that. The butter. Let me tell you, it's so nice. You know, thank you, Santi, for buying, for getting it, man. That is so nice to get the attention after so many years. Well, I guess which is the point of your show. You know, it's like people. I know a lot of people say I. I don't care what people think. I do it for myself. But I think most people do care, and they like. They want to be appreciated and liked when they create something. You know, like music yeah. and, and everything. Um. And so did we. We, when we hear, um, there's um, oh, I gotta throw this in. Um, about seven years ago, I was in New York City, living in New York, in New Yorkers, and there was an, a podcast called Appetite for Distortion. Have you ever heard of that? Um, no, I have not. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. YouTube, the whole interview it was kind of like this, but more uh, Appetite for Distortion is all catered towards. Guns N' Roses stories. And of oh, course, man. I knew Ricky and Axel, I met Axel, I knew Alm when they first got here. It was like an hour long or an hour and a half long, all about the Guns N' Roses connection. Uh, now, why did I bring this up? <laughs> oh my God. I'm sorry, I'm getting all that for What was I wrong with this? <laughs> because you, because you, you said that uh, you liked uh, when uh, fans are recognized for the labor and stuff like that. Yeah. Thank you for that. I, I liked that when that came out and I talked about Shire, they asked a lot of Shire questions and we got attention on YouTube for, for our, you know, we got more views. You got about like, I think two or 3000 views. It was because of that. And mm -hmm. so I love, I like to win that. I like the fact that people are getting interested again, you know, even, I know, I mean, no, we're not going to make any money on it. I just like the attention. Yeah. And no, you guys I mean, deserve yeah. it, you know? Yeah, it's Thank your legacy. You it's, it. it's your legacy. And I think it's it's mm -hmm. something to be proud of, definitely. I mean, you guys uh, put together 
a great uh, set of songs and they should be heard. I mean, um, I really, I, I was I, I was just telling Jay earlier today, the song, Do You Know What It's Like? It has a great catchy hook and, and it's, a, it's a fantastic song as, as, as the, the, all the songs on the EP are. And, and, and definitely, I mean, the, I, I feel like a lot of the times uh, uh, some uh, there's music that, uh, that that goes underrated, uh, and it's it's a, it's a shame. I mean, if I can help uh, putting it out there for people to hear, I mean, I I'll, I'll do it because I think it deserves it. Thank you. Thanks well, a lot, Santin. Thank you, Dave. I, well, I'm, I'm, I'll say this: it doesn't matter on what level you're you went to as far as making music goes. You did it. You were there in the scene. You played the clubs, you did the whole, you put the EP out. You you were produced by Don Dock and Michael Wagner. Uh, Michael Wagner alone is a, a legendary producer who's got great stuff out there. It, it When it comes to music, sometimes bands with less talent become superstars and bands that are very talented don't quite get there. So it's a matter of luck. It's a matter of, you know, it, it, it's, it's a Connections, game yeah. of how, how the scene is going to lay at that particular time. So when you say you're not a rock star, you are absolutely 100% a rock star. You did it. You put the <laughs> album out and, you know, something to be proud of. And if we can keep it going and yeah, I, I, if we could bring other fans in that never heard that album and want to, you know, then that's great. Absolutely. Yeah, you don't have to be. You don't have to be on the Billboard Top 200. Not to, at all. To, to, to yeah. for that, Dave, that, what you did. That's, that's the spirit that's of this good. podcast for sure. Yeah, that's the spirit of the show, and uh, we always welcome every every everyone that had a part back then. I mean, it's it, it, it's welcome here. I mean, uh, we all we all for that. So. Uh, and uh, and and you had a big part. I mean, you played with everybody. So <laughs> yeah. before we go, uh, you got to get Vicky Hamilton because she'll come on this because she wrote a book, well, and I she would love to. Book. I did send gonna... her a friend request. She didn't accept it as of right now. So <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll resend it. I'm sure a lot of people hit her up. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Because uh, maybe she has. Uh, I don't know what other way you can get in touch with her. Maybe she, there's a. There's a email, email. or something, but yeah. um, it'd be a very interesting character to interview. Oh, I would love sure. to talk to her. She seems yeah, very definitely. cool, and and she works. She still works in the music industry. I think she works with a lot of country bands and stuff like that now too, which is cool. Which is you know, it, it's cool that she she made something out of that, you know, and nah. and and, yeah. and she then she's she's partly responsible for given us some of the bands that we love. So it's, it's cool. Absolutely. We would love to have her on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Be definitely. Very cool. And um, yeah, ah, for sure. I mean, yeah, uh, of course I would love to. Yeah. Well, well, someday, someday will happen. If we, if we force it, we, we it will happen. So, <laughs> so uh, Ellen, um, Thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, you are now a friend of the show, so whenever you want to be back, uh, you're more than welcome to. And uh, quick, before we go, uh, do you want to plug any upcoming shows or anything like that? Um, I have a new band where I sing, and it's called Rain Ballet. Like, you know, ballet, like a dance, Rain Ballet. Yeah. Okay. Again, where you can hear it, it's YouTube. Uh, type in Rain Ballet Topic or Rain Ballet Call Me Crazy. You can see the new video of it, and I hope you like it. Oh, it's cool. different. Okay. It's more gothic. So the, you can see the video Call Me Crazy, Rain Ballet. Very gothic. Hopefully you like it. I hope you like it. All right, man. Uh, I mean, it's been great. Uh, it's been an honor yeah, having you here. And uh, I don't know. I feel like... Uh, you got stories out the wasu. <laughs> you, you might want to consider a, a a book. Yeah, oh, I I can't I can't read or write. <laughs> That's all right. You just tell them, and then somebody else will do the writing. There you go. That's you get a good writer. Yeah. Here, Nobody writes. Here, listen to this. This could this could be where you start. 
<laughs> audiobook. Yeah. Well, right, you know, man. I can think of anybody else that you guys can interview. I will message you on Facebook and I will sure. let you know um, who it is. And if, it, if I know him, I'll tell him about you guys. Awesome. I mean, Very I cool. appreciate that. Yeah, that would be really great. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Sure. All right. All right, man. Um, uh, thank uh, once again. Thank you, and uh, I hope you had a great time. And and we yeah, we certainly time. did. So so thank yeah, you again absolutely. for doing the show. And uh, I think I think that's all for tonight, guys. So uh, I, I I hope to talk to you guys uh, soon. Uh, and uh, I'll let you guys know when the episode is out. Uh, Alan, I'll make a Facebook post about it. Uh, I'll I'll, copy, I'll I'll tag you and I'll let you know. Thank you so much, Santi and Dave. Too nice to meet you. So nice to meet you. Absolutely, you Alan. Too, man. Thank you. Take care. Bye -bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye.